Welcome everybody to this webinar. I am so glad that you could join us today. This is the first webinar in our early childhood webinar series. And we're gonna to focus today on cognitive development and learning in young children. As the presenter, I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself. In terms of my background and professional experiences, I was trained as a school psychologist and I worked as a school psychologist for a number of years. I also worked as a trainer of graduate students in school psychology. And I've had a number of different positions in terms of whether working with young children or working with the assessments of young children. Done a lot of work around um, cognitive assessment. And so I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you today about cognitive development and how that relates to learning in young children. I do wanna say in terms of disclosures before we get started, I do work for Pearson Clinical Assessment, which is the sponsor of this webinar. And I have no relevant non-financial information to disclose. And also in terms of Pearson Clinical Assessment, Pearson Clinical Assessment is the publisher or the distributor of the assessments that I will reference during the presentation. What we'd like you to um, know by the end of our time together today, we'll talk about cognitive factors that may explain differences in learning. We'll talk about the process of learning and we'll talk about data that'll help us to identify learning needs of young children. So to get us started thinking about our content, I want to think about early childhood programs. And when we think about early childhood programs, or whenever we talk about young children, sometimes we struggle to distinguish between, from, between infants and toddlers, where you're thinking about birth through the age of two years, birth to three years, if you will. Um, versus um, three-year-olds up to eight-year-olds. So we're thinking about early childhood programs, and I'm going to talk about infants and toddlers to some extent because I want to talk about cognitive development starting in infancy. But when I think about instruction, I want to think about early childhood programs starting more at age three and going up through the age of eight years. So when we think about early childhood programs, one of the things that we know about children, um, but today we're talking about young children, but pretty much any child, we know that there is tremendous variability in terms of their performance, right? So that some children learn the skills we teach in the regular classroom, they keep up with our pacing, um, the curriculum, the instruction, the pedagogy, all seem to work effectively for, for them. But on the other hand, we have some children who learn the skills with additional specialized instruction. In addition, we have some children who might respond as soon as the teacher asks a question, whereas other children may take a long time to respond. And the question is, what are the factors that would explain such variability in performance? Well, there are probably a number of factors, and some of those factors um, certainly are extrinsic to the individual, and some are intrinsic to the individual. So when we think about the work of Dr. Virginia Berninger, um, whose name I'll mention a few times as we work through the hour here today, you think about some extrinsic factors that affect the learner skills, certainly the curriculum, the instructional materials, the teacher's instruction or pedagogy, and those are external factors that could impact the learner skills. Hopefully, as my teacher is teaching me, I'm actually learning all the skills, I'm acquiring the knowledge that she would, um, would expect me to, right? Um, however, in, in addition to those external factors, there are some individual differences that are unique to me, the learner, those individual differences in the processes in the learner's brain. And today, what we want to focus on are those individual differences. What are those um, components or the, the 
the factors, the cognitive factors, the makeup of the individual's brain that actually influence would influence the skills of the learner. So I want to take my cues from some of our professional organizations, for example, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, NAEYC. Um, when we think about domains of development and learning and we think about young children, certainly we think about, about some develop, developmental areas. And we also think about some areas that develop in response to to direct instruction. So we think about physical development, for example, health, health as well as self-help skills. You're thinking about the development of the large muscles that would allow the young child to run and hop and skip and jump, the development of the fine muscles, the small muscles that would allow the child to write and draw and pick up small objects um, possibly using a dynamic grasp, maybe by the time the child is toward the end of, of pre-kindergarten, for example. So you're thinking about physical development. You're also thinking about the things that children need in, all, in order to develop healthy bodies, in order to be able to take care of their personal needs, like brushing their teeth and maybe um, brushing their hair and, and putting on their own shoes and putting on their clothes and so on. So physical development is a really important component. Um, but in addition to physical development, we also think about the development of social and emotional parts of who we are. So we think about how the, the young child interacts with other young children, how the young child interacts with his or her teachers, interacts with, um, with, with other adults in his or her environment. You also think about the emotional development of the young child and thinking about whether or not the child is able to, um, to respond appropriately, to exercise um, self-control. So thinking about those, those skills and behaviors that really allow the child to sit quietly, to follow directions, and maybe to respond when called upon. So social emotional development is an important component of, of early development, as is physical development. Then we also want to think about approaches to learning. And I'll talk more about approaches to learning um, here in a few minutes. But when we think about, about approaches to learning with respect to young children, you're thinking about children's dispositions, how they, they begin a task, how they persist um, with that task until they've completed it, or whether they decide, well, I can't figure it out, so I'm gonna give it up, I'm gonna give up, or I can't figure it out, maybe I need to go and ask for help. So when you think about approaches to learning as I'm describing it that way, certainly those of you who work with young children, you would be familiar with that terminology. Those of you who work with older children primarily, you might refer to approaches to learning as executive functions. You're really thinking about those, those behaviors that will allow me to plan and organize and act, actually execute a task, right? So we'll talk more about approaches to learning later. And then also when you think about domains of development and learning, Possibly one of the domains that really kind of stands out when we meet a young child is really the language. Is the child able to understand the language that I am using in interacting with the child? Is the child able to respond? And what about speech sound? Is there a coordination between the, the child's um, speech what the child says and the sounds that are produced. So you're thinking more about maybe um, speech as opposed to language. So we'll talk more about language as we go. And then the focus of our discussion today really is cognitive development. And when we think about cognitive development, I want to know how young children express their thoughts and ideas, how young children think, how they reason, how they solve problems, how they pay attention, how they show me that they remember what they learned yesterday. 
When we think about the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework, ages birth to five, you see those same broad domains of development and learning. Certainly the approaches to learning, social and emotional development, the physical development component here, the language, um, as well as the cognition. And the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework divides these five central domains into um, two different groups, the infant toddler domains, as well as the preschooler domains. And for the most part, you could see that those domains are consistent across the age range, starting at birth and going up through age eight or nine, if you will. But down here under language, sorry, here under language and literacy, notice for infants and toddlers, the focus is on the development of language and communication, receptive language and expressive language. We also focus on those components for preschoolers, but in addition, we introduce the literacy component, um, connecting literacy to language. And in terms of cognition, certainly um, we, we think about cognition across this um, age range, but the, the cognition is expressed in terms of mathematics, reasoning, and scientific reasoning when we think about preschoolers. So I think you, you think about these domains and you notice that a number of professional organizations will focus on the same domains. Now, one of the important questions is how it is that young children actually um, actually develop and grow. And a number of developmental psychologists, developmental neuroscientists um, have actually conducted research to answer the questions about factors that facilitate early growth and development, as well as factors that mitigate against early growth and development, right? So Dr. Ross Thompson, um, who wrote an article in 2001 in the future of children talked about the interrelatedness of development, looking at the development of the body, the development of the mind, the development of the person, and the development of the brain. And when you look at these um, developmental areas, again, you see the consistency between what we have here and what we talked about with respect to and AEYC, as well as the Head Start Early Learning Framework. When you think about the body, probably from, from birth to certainly maybe three or four years, years old, one of the, the, the big changes is really obvious, right? We see the child actually changing in terms of size. We see the proportions of the body actually um, evening out. Like for example, the baby whose head is really large, as the child gets older, you notice that the, the size of the head is proportionate to the rest of the body. You also think about the development of the large muscles and the small muscles that I talked about. And you think about health and you think about factors that will facilitate the development, certainly having a nutritious diet, um, it would be important to the development of the body and some factors that might mitigate against that physical development might be, for example, um, we've heard stories about houses where there, there was lead and how does that impact the child's development. And then you think about the development of the mind. And one of the things that I want you to think about when we look at the, the mind and the components that are included here, certainly thinking. And when we think about cognition, that's what we think about, right? Um, no pun intended. Thinking is what we think about. So, but the mind really, when we think, we think in terms of language, I think using concepts and all of my thinking really is in service of problem solving. So if a child is struggling or if a child has a global, cognitive delay or global developmental delay, might that be manifested in terms of performance on language measures, in terms of maybe a test of basic concepts, and then also in terms of tasks that require the child to, to think and reason and solve problems. And then you also think about the social emotional that we talked about earlier, the development of the person. What are my relationships with others my age, relationships with adults? How do I understand? 
again, um, that I need to behave when I go to my home versus when I go to school. And all of this, you think really the growth of the brain and the way that we know that the, the brain is growing, of course, is when we look at the growth of the body, the growth of the mind, the growth of the person. So behavioral achievements and physical achievements really provide some clues about what is likely to be happening in the brain, how the neurons and the synapses are connecting and um, how experiences actually facilitate um, that development. Now, in terms of development, if a child is developing as we expect him or her to, those would be the children who, might, who would be theoretically achieving or learning the skills at the rate at which we are presenting them in the classroom. But what about those few children, and hopefully just a few, those children who are not learning at the expected rate? Might it be because their development in one or more of these broad domains is delayed. Might there be delays in terms of physical development? And I will tell you, sometimes we, when we think about physical development, we think about those um, large muscles, we think about those small muscles, but we sometimes don't think about the fact that the oromotor structure also relies on the development of the muscle, right? So that sometimes children who might struggle with some gross motor functions, who might struggle with some fine motor or visual motor integration functions may also struggle um, to produce sounds correctly so that their speech may not be a, as intelligible as we would expect it to be at a certain age. So when we think about physical, certainly there might be a delay in terms of physical development. How would that impact learning in the classroom? If there is a delay in cognitive development, how would that manifest in the classroom? Communication, social, emotional, or adaptive. And effectively, what we wanna be able to do is to identify as early as possible developmental delays so that we can provide either early intervention services for, for um, infants and toddlers birth through age two um, under part C, um, IDEA part C, or maybe for older children provide early intervening services under IDEA part B ages three through nine years. So we want to think about certainly what we know about early development, what we know about the interrelatedness of these broad domains, physical, cognitive, communication, um, the social, emotional, and adaptive or self-help. But I want to talk today primarily about the cognitive factors and how cognition and learning are related. So I had to think through about the best way to talk about cognitive factors. And as we know, if you are a psychologist listening in, a school psychologist listening in, you know that there are a number of, the a number of theories about cognitive abilities, right? So I selected a few to kind of make the point that I wanna make here today, but recognize that there are a number of other theories that I'm not covering in the interest of time. So when I think, for example, about human cognitive abilities, and I wanna use for this example, Cattell Horn Carroll structure of human cognitive abilities, CHC theory. So when we think about cognition, we're thinking primarily about the ability to engage in complex mental processing. We don't always think about what we're doing as complex, but when we are solving problems, whether it's a math problem or maybe I'm reading a story and then I answer questions about the story. I'm really not focused on all of the different um, specific cognitive abilities that are involved in that process. But when you think about thinking and reasoning and we think about general ability, general ability really is the way we describe complex mental processing. 
But in order to engage effectively in complex mental processing, I need to engage a number of specific abilities. So this G right here at the apex of this hierarchy kind of looks at that, that general ability, sometimes referred to as psychometric G. And psychometric G, that general ability, consists of a number of specific abilities, including crystallized intelligence, fluid intelligence, visual spatial processing, certainly memory, both short term as well as long term. And then speed, cognitive processing speed is an important um, cognitive ability when we think about learning and then auditory processing. So I'm gonna talk about each of these and I wanna relate these directly to learning. So if you think about Excuse learning- me, Dr. McCool? Yes. Can you move your- um uh yes that on the top there to the bottom of your screen okay because it seems to be you should be able to just drag it down because it seems to be cutting out the uh okay let's see if i title can. of the slide okay thanks okay how about that that better is it cutting it out still now it's cutting out the bottom but it's cutting out just the wave on them, so that's better. Okay, Let's see. thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. All right, so, so in addition to those CHC cognitive abilities that I just shared with you, certainly learning requires all of these, the crystallized intelligence, the fluid reasoning, and so on. But in addition, learning requires specific neuropsychological processes, right? For example, attention, um, executive functions, orthographic processing. A lot of what we learn in school is visual. So I need to be able to process visual information. And some of the visual information is symbolic, like all of these letters that I'm showing you right here. These are all symbolic. When I show you numbers, that's symbolic language, right? I need to be able to process that information and translate those symbols into, into meaning. And ideally, you want me not just to process the information, you want me to do so quickly. So rapid automatic naming and rapid auto automatic switching really are related to that processing speed. Overall though, you want me to learn efficiently. And it's going to be my memory and how I engage my memory that's going to dictate how efficiently I learn. Am I able to make connections, associative memory? When I see a word, can I associate that with its visual um, label? So can I see and say? Can I recall information from my long-term memory? All of the information that I need, free recall. Um, how am I doing with meaningful memory? So all of these are important components when we think about human cognitive abilities and what's required in order to learn efficiently. So if you think about learning as the process, learning is the process of acquiring information. I think what happens is whenever I go to markup, that's when it comes down, it looks like. So if you think about learning as the process of acquiring information, then we want to try to understand that process, right? So what are those cognitive factors that will allow children to show their learning? In other words, we can use labels to label that process, and a number of researchers have. For example, um, Dr. Dan Miller, in his book, Essentials of School Neuropsychological Assessment, has labeled that process. How do we collect information? How do we sort the information? How do we store it? How do we retrieve it? And then Dr. Colin Elliott, in his book, um, in his test, um, Differential Ability Scales, talks about, he uses different labels but the process effectively is the same, the same, right? How do I receive the information? How do I take it in? How do I perceive it? How do I make sense of it? How do I process it? How do I remember it? So all of those, when you think about that process, think about information processing and what we know about information 
processing, that effectively we're thinking about how information enters the mind. Well, um, maybe from the environment. Maybe I see something in my environment. I hear something in my environment. That information gets in through my senses. I'll talk more about these here in just a second. So the information enters the mind um, through your senses. I make sense of it through my perceptual processes. Um, then I store it. Maybe I transform it to get it into my memory. Um, memory that includes both short-term memory and long-term memory. And then I use the information for thinking, and I may actually use language to express my thoughts. I may think in language. So you see that this process is really cyclical, right? So information can go from, from your sensory processes to your memory, from your memory back to your sensory processes, to your perceptual processes, from memory to thinking, from thinking back to memory, and so on. So I want to say a few words about, about this multifactorial process using some labels for different cognitive abilities, again, borrowing from the work of Dr. Dan Miller, who says that when we think about learning, think about learning in terms of building blocks. And at the foundation of learning of that process would be sensory motor functions and attentional processes. And then once we take in the information through our senses and by paying attention, some of that information that we take in might be visual, might be visual spatial, some might be language, then that information gets into our memory. We want to learn the information. We want to remember it by retrieving it from long-term memory. And then what are some executive functions that are involved? Can I switch mental set as I go? And then can I perform all of these um, different abilities? Can I integrate them quickly? So the speed and efficiency of cognitive processing. So up at the top, you see the overall cognitive functioning. Again, think about that as your psychometric G, the ability to engage in complex mental processing that is dependent on all of these functions, some of which are considered to be basic psychological processes, some of which are sometimes referred to as higher order processes. And then, of course, we, we always have to recognize the importance of the social emotional, the cultural, the environmental, and the situational factors. So I want to say a few words about each of these, and then we want to look at some data. So when you think about the collection of information, certainly um, think about sensory, right? Sensory is is at the beginning when you think about how we collect information. We collect information, um, sensation occurs when information contacts or sensory receptors, whether my eyes, my ears, my tongue, my nose, my skin. And then what you want is for me to make sense of the, the sensory experience that I'm having. So if I hear, for example, a sound, I'm like, oh yeah, that is music. Or maybe I hear a sound right now. Oh, that's the sound of my doorbell ringing. Or maybe I see a word on a page and I know, um, I know that it's time for lunch, right? Or whatever it is. Now, sometimes the information comes in through multiple senses, whether you're thinking maybe about intermodal perception. Sometimes you see something like, for example, I have this picture over here of this little girl. When I see that little girl, the information is gonna come in through my eye, right? It's gonna come in through my eyes, but I'm gonna process that information through my phonological loop. Badly talks about the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad. So as soon as I see her, I am immediately going to say, girl. I'm not going to try to describe what I'm seeing. I'm going to associate a phonological code or verbal label with what I'm seeing. So that's the intermodal perception where sometimes you might be able to make sense of the information using multiple modalities. Now, one of the components that is really important when you think about perception is discrimination, right? So sometimes I can't make sense 
of what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing because of a weakness in maybe auditory discrimination or visual discrimination. So for example, if I say, I having laid out a number of different objects on the table and I ask the child to show me the doll. And let's say there's a, a little doll, um, there are several objects and one of the objects is a ball. And say the child picks up the ball, um, I am not sure if that is um, an issue with auditory discrimination the child actually discriminated ball, which meant that she perceived that she perceived. She heard me say ball, and then she knows what a ball is. And so she picks up the ball. It could be an issue of auditory discrimination, or it could be that she does not know the verbal label doll for, for that object. It may be that if I ask her mom, her mom might say, oh, she knows that as the baby. So to tease that out, if I'm assessing her, I could say, well, um, show me the baby, right? And if she picks up the baby, then I know it's not a lack of, it's not conceptual knowledge that it's not auditory discrimination that is at issue. It's actually the verbal label with which she's familiar. It's background knowledge. You might have the same concept with um with visual discrimination what letter is this like let's say i show you the b and you say that is a d right so again that would be visual discrimination so discrimination is an important component when you think about visual perception and auditory perception now a lot of times when i think about assessment of cognitive abilities i think in terms of how you take in the information and then how you how you respond so when you think about responses in terms of sensory development you think about typically motor responses right so sensory motor being able to integrate the sense with a motor response whether it's visual motor integration or it might be that I'm trying to give you a verbal response and I'm really struggling to put together the words. But here you could see some children who are demonstrating this output response where they are maybe responding to an instruction um, that required them to draw. And then attention is at the foundation, as I mentioned, sensory motor as well as attention. Both are at the foundation of learning. Children should be able to focus and su sustain their attention. How often do you, if you work in a preschool classroom, how often do you say, pay attention, put on your listening ears. I want you to get ready to look because you know that the child is going to have to receive the information through the ear, through the eye. So you need to make sure that the child is actually paying attention. So when you think about attention, think about, um, am I able to focus my attention? Am I able to ignore competing um, stimuli? Am I able to sustain my attention? Well, my ability to sustain my attention really will depend on my age, right? When we think about infants, we don't necessarily use the term attention. We talk more about habituation, where the infant becomes disinterested in a stimulus after he or she has paid attention to it um, for maybe a brief period of time. Um, but the changes in ability to pay attention really um, are important because when you think about three-year-olds and four-year-olds, they love to run around, which is why in our early childhood classrooms for threes and fours, we often have a number of different areas, right? So the child can move from one area to the next, um, which is what young children will do. As they get older, they're able to sit quietly and focus and sustain attention for longer periods, which of course also will have a dramatic influence on, on their learning. So are they able to demonstrate different kinds of attention? And then when you think about what happens in the classroom, much of what is presented in school has either a visual spatial basis or a language basis. You think about reading, you think about math, um, visual spatial and language. Um, visual perceptual skills certainly are important when you think about handwriting, um, but also when you think about reading, visual analysis, b 
ed. I may be able to analyze or segment a word, but I may be able to blend or put those sounds together, visual synthesis. Again, it's important for us to unpack those, um, those abilities. And then what about language? Um, language is an important component of language, the ability to understand language. Um, you think sometimes about your listening vocabulary. Um, you should understand words and sentences to be able to make sense of what I'm asking you to do, to be able to process the information. Expressive language, you should be able to use words to show us that you can retrieve information from memory. But when you think about language, you think about all five parts of language, starting with phonology. The sound system is important, right? Morphology is important. The smallest unit of the word that will convey meaning, like the ED added to a verb, for example. You certainly think about, about syntax in grammar, the structure of the sentence. You think about semantics. You, you need a good vocabulary in order to be able to understand. And then what about the pragmatics of language, right? So, so it's really important when we think about language for children to be able to understand language and also to use language. So here, for example, if I were to ask the child to show me, show me blue, show me red, show me yellow, or expressively, I might point to it and say, what color is this? Right. And then the child is going to use a verbal label to respond. Now, language is important um, on its own, but it's also important because it's foundational for literacy. So, again, Virginia Berninger talks about the importance when you think about literacy that being able, those early reading skills, being able to recognize and name letters, to identify the letter name, to identify the letter sound. Those early literacy skills really depend on whether I understand um, language phonologically. When I hear words, I can hear syllables in words. Cowboy consists of two syllables. Cow consists of the k and the ow, the onset and the rhyme. And then also that I can hear the phonemes or the sounds. And then in addition to being able to hear them, that I can also produce them. So you're thinking about the receptive phonological component of the oral system, as well as the expressive phonological component of the oral system developing in an age appropriate manner. And certainly the connector between the oral language and the written language reading is phonological awareness, more specifically phonemic proficiency. So for example, if I were to say, I were to ask the child, say cat, now say cat, but don't say k. How quickly can the child tell me that what is left is the word at, right? So again, that phonemic proficiency really is important when you're making that transition from oral language to literacy. And certainly all of this, we always talked about the fact that all learning occurs in a working memory environment. Memory is actually the way that we know that learning persists, right? So we expect children to learn and remember information. And often the type of information that we present is um, either visual or it's verbal. Some of the information is new to the child. Some of is information that they've already acquired. So I may ask the child, for example, to learn. I may assess learning and remembering um, visual spatial information by maybe some task like this. I might tell the child, we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna put this picture here and this picture here. And I want you to look at them carefully and remember where they are. This one is here and this one is here. Now I'm gonna take them away. Put this one where it belongs. And the child picks it up and puts it here. Now put this one where it belongs and the child picks it up and puts it here. So again, there are a number of tasks that we can use to assess learning and remembering. But if you think about learning and remembering um, in relation 
to early, early reading skills or literacy, you think about learning and remembering letters and words maybe really you have to remember for for words for letters you have to remember different forms or different letter forms or different word forms so for example at the bottom here if i'm showing you letters and words you're looking at the orthographic the visual word form right and if you, as soon as you see the visual word form, if you can immediately say its name under word pronunciation, word sound knowledge, I see the word, word, and I can immediately say its name, that's great. And if I, at the same time, also know its meaning, the semantic lexicon, um, that is great. Ultimately, for reading comprehension, what we want is for you to be able to see the word, to be able to say it as soon as you see it, and to simultaneously know the meaning. If you can efficiently integrate those three word forms, then you don't have to use much of your mental energy for that task. You can use your mental energy to focus on the, the bigger task, which is the comprehension. Now, over to the right, under phonological rules, um, sometimes when I see a word, I may not be able to say the word right away. I may need to segment, like I, I mentioned previously, I may need to segment and then blend. That would be your word analysis knowledge. Now, when information comes into our senses, we the information comes into our short-term memory. And we have to do something to maintain that information in our short-term memory. Working memory is part of the short-term memory system. And it is within working memory that we manipulate or transform information. So I like the definition by Cohen and Alloway who define working memory um, like this. Working memory, first of all, is the information, right? So when you think about this, it is first of all information. I have to hold information in my mind and I need that information to simultaneously perform and correctly complete some type of cognitive task. Think about what this means. You say you read a, a word problem, for example, in math. I have to register what you say. I have to determine what information is important in order to complete whatever the problem is that you're asking me to solve. I have to maintain the information. Here's the thing about maintaining information. It doesn't just stay there. I have to do something actively to maintain it there, right? So, and what do I need to do? I need to rehearse. I need to keep saying it over and over in order for that information to stay in my short-term memory so that then I can manipulate it. So for example, if you give me a word problem that requires me to know that I have 50 cents and I spend, I buy three things, one that costs 10 cents, one that costs five cents, one that costs seven cents, and how much money do I have left? then I need to try to maintain all of those numbers in my brain while at the same time adding up what I spent 10 and five and seven and then subtracting that from 50. So you see how complex working memory is because it's not as if I can just keep the information there. I have to be rehearsing. And as I'm rehearsing, maybe I may lose some of the important numbers that I need in order to solve the problem. Executive functions is another important um, cognitive ability. And certainly for young children, we talk more about self-regulation, where you're thinking about the ability of the young child to inhibit his or her behavior. Like for example, um, don't blurt out the answer um, and instead perform a behavior like raise your hand and wait for the teacher to call on you, right? So self-regulation really is an important component of executive function when you think about young children. So for example, if you present this picture and ask the child to read the word, the child has to inhibit his or her tendency as a four-year-old to focus on the most salient feature on that page, which is going to be the dog 
and instead name, um, read the word under the dog, which is the word cat. And then certainly you want me to work and learn efficiently. And that's where cognitive processing speed comes in. Now, the thing is that as, as children get older, their processing capacity increases, just like on working memory, your working memory capacity increases. Maybe for, for a four-year-old, you're able to, to hold in your short-term memory two pieces of information. By the time you're about seven, that capacity has doubled. For us as adults, we know the rule. Probably um, we are able to maintain um, seven plus or minus two bits of information, right? We always talk about that in terms of the, the, the telephone. So here, for example, how quickly can you label these colors? Again, the rapid automatic naming. How quickly can you label these letters, right? How quickly can you effectively see and say? When you see the visual image, can you quickly retrieve from long-term memory its phonological code? That's what we do when we are reading. So when we think about some of the assessments that are used to assess cognitive abilities, like the Bailey 4 that's used starting at 16 days and going up to three and a half years, you're thinking, you notice here, most of those cognitive abilities that we reference, sensory abilities, attention, um, visual motor and perceptual, habituation, which is the term that we use for attention when we look at infants, problem solving, memory, classification and concepts. You think about an assessment for older young children, think about maybe the WIPSI-4 where we're looking at verbal abilities that crystallized intelligence, visual spatial abilities, fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed, right? And when we think about reading, we think about the cognitive processes that are related to reading. What's the process of learning to read? First, I need to register written words into my temporary memory, my short-term memory. I may need to segment the units of the written word in my working memory if I don't immediately recognize the, 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 the whole word, right? I may need to segment. I may need to use phonological awareness. I may need to even go down to the level of the phony, right? Cat, k, a, t, right? I see the symbol, I associate its phoneme, and then I put them together. And that's where the verbal working memory, which is over on your right, will come in. So using the grammar information, um, knowing your, your words and concepts, and that's your language, right? Semantics. You, when you think about semantics and oral language, you think about two parts, really. You think about the content, which is the word knowledge, but you also think about knowledge of concepts. And then you have to maybe tell me the answer or read out loud. That would be your expressive language. And the inhibition, monitoring, and shifting set those are those executive functions. And the same concepts when you think about math. And I'll leave this with you to take a look at um, at your leisure. So when we think about some of the data, what the data would tell us about learning, here might be a child age four years, 11 months, who was born prematurely, identified with a global developmental delay when she was six months old, who received early intervention services, um, followed by services in early Head Start, and who is now being evaluated um, because she's getting ready to transition to a public school program. When you look over to the right, you could see those composite scores for different cognitive abilities um, as measured by the WIPC4, the full scale IQ that would conceptually be your psychometric G, that consists of a number of specific abilities, verbal comprehension, visual spatial, fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. And you see those composite scores in the 60s, fluid reasoning, um, high 50s, um, mean uh, being 100, standard deviation 15. You see the associated percentile ranks. All of these scores you notice 
um, the highest percentile rank is two. And if you think about planning a program for this child, we also want to look at the adaptive behavior scores from the adaptive behavior assessment system. You could see those composite scores as well. And what we know is that this child was previously identified with a global developmental delay. And these scores appear to support that classification or that diagnosis um, at the time she was six months old. So she'll definitely require some direct specialized instruction uh, in order to continue to develop her skills based on what we know about her cognitive ability as well as her adaptive behavior. And then here is a child whose age is three years, seven months. And I'll pause for a second to give you a minute to look at those scores. And I think what we look at here again is conceptually your psychometric G, again, the mean of 100 standard deviation 15. So the full scale IQ here, um, approximately one standard deviation below the mean. But you also see some variability in her scores, right? So verbal comprehension, her composite score of 79, visual spatial composite score of 94, working memory composite score of 90. And when you look at these scores, you might immediately generate a hypothesis. Verbal comprehension actually is the only index here where the child receives the information through the ear and then provides a verbal response versus visual, spatial, and working memory, where the child receives or takes in the information through the eye and then provides maybe a visual motor integrative or sensory motor response, if you will. So it's possible that language receptive vocabulary is at issue, um, and as well as the knowledge that she has acquired so far that we assess using the information subtest. So receptive vocabulary, we always think about that in terms of language, but my understanding of language also is an acquired skill, right? So when you think about verbal comprehension in terms of acquired skills, it looks like that's where she is struggling. So we probably wanna make sure that we focus attention on language for her, on helping her to develop oral language and the oral language acquisition inventory um, authored by Dr. Gentile might be um, something or something similar that you'd wanna take a look at. And then we also have um, another set of data here and um, take a look at that when you get a chance. We do wanna make sure that we provide a few minutes here for, um, for questions. So I'm gonna summarize this now and leave you with some additional information. Here is what I hope you take away from this presentation. If a child is struggling with grade level skills, one of the things that is helpful is the identification of the cognitive factors that are necessary to perform that skill. So we want to be able to identify the cognitive factors that'll help us to understand why the child is struggling with that specific skill. And those cognitive factors can range from sensory motor functions and attentional processes that are foundational to some of the higher order um, cognitive processes like visual spatial processing, language processes, memory and learning, and so on. I included some references um, that I talked about during the presentation. But I also want to let you know that this is the first um, presentation in the early childhood webinar series, as I mentioned, and there are three more, and we hope that you'll be able to attend those as well. Next week, Dr. Ann Baim will be presenting on relational concepts, and then next week as well, we'll look at sensory and motor development, and on October 13th, we'll talk more about social emotional development looking at proactive behavior support. And I included the link that you could use to access registration information for these. Okay, so are there questions, um, Nancy, that I might be able to answer? Sorry, let me take myself off mute.
And let me take a look at um, the questions that are, let's see, still open. Is there a typical level of sustained attention for young children? This often appears to be based on cultural background. Yeah, and I, I think that's, um, that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, again, it, it truly depends on the child. I think your typical four-year-old, three and four-year-olds tend to move very quickly from one task to another. But again, it appears to be task specific. Very often, if a teacher is reading a story to a child, I can see children who can sit quietly and listen attentively for about 10 minutes, especially if they are engaged and also interacting. So yes, for the most part, um, it, it depends on the age of the child. I would say um, about five to 10 minutes, depending on the nature of the task for your, your threes and fours. And another is um, on the Bailey scale for infants, is there, um, how well does it predict child performance on the WIPSI, for example, for older children? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for asking. So we, we that the concept that we talk about in terms of predictions from infant toddler assessments like the Bailey 4 to um, other assessments like the WIPSI 4 really has to do with the stability of intelligence. And one of the things that we know is that intelligence really doesn't seem to stabilize until about the age of five and sometimes even beyond the age of five. So the, the predictions from, from the Bailey Four, those, those coefficients, the predictors from the Bailey Four to the Wipsy Four probably wouldn't be the, the, the highest, but definitely there is some some reliability in terms of broad, like broad descriptions. Like if a child's if a child's development is within normal limits on the Bailey four, it is highly likely that the child's development on the Wipsy four would continue to be within normal limits as well. Um, by the same token, we understand the effectiveness of early intervention. So if a child's development is identified as delayed using the Bailey 4, it is possible that with early intervention, you would see that the child's development um, on the, the WIPSI 4, that you might see higher scores there. But again, the concept is the stability of intelligence. And we know that for a three-month-old intelligence has yet to stabilize. Okay, great. I There's one last one. I'm not sure you really have time other than to direct people to Dr. Berninger's work, but when cognitive weaknesses are identified, what remediation do you advise? So I think, and, and that's certainly Dr. Virginia Berninger's work, but but there's also there, there are also other researchers who talk about we are focused on cognitive development because of because we know of its relationship to learning. So let's say, for example, a child is struggling with visual discrimination. Well, I may want to focus on visual discrimination, but I really am interested in that particular cognitive skill because of its impact on reading. So I want to teach reading and emphasize a skill that I know is weak. So I think there's a body of research out there that talks about whether we should actually try to train cognitive um, areas, certainly for attention and working memory. There are programs that'll do that. But for the most part, think about the learning um, that's affected by that cognitive ability and then focus on, on developing those, those content skills, if you will, while emphasizing that, that cognitive ability that we know would, would help the child to do better on that particular skill. And that is it for today. Okay, okay. I see we have reached time. Um, I'd like to thank you, Dr. McCool, for sharing all your expertise with us. And a big thank you to all of our chat box monitors for all of your help. Thank you for, our particip for your participation.
please leave your browser open as an action item list will pop up. Look for your certificate of attendance in your email later this week. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And this does conclude the webinar. Thank you.